Drew, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me on again, Stefan. I really appreciate being here. Yeah, so I mean, there's been so much going on this year, and you know, here we are, December 2022. There's been <laughs> just a complete blow up of, uh, you know, quote unquote crypto, right? But there's been, obviously been an impact onto us here in the, you know, in the in the Bitcoin world. So, you know, what are some of your reflections on um, what's going on in this bear cycle or downturn or whatever we're calling this? Yeah, no, it, it has been a strange few years for so many reasons, right? Like the macro situation has been crazy even outside of crypto or Bitcoin. And then, of course, this past year with the collapse of so many large players in the space, um, it has been a wild ride. Um, my emotions are mixed. Uh, as you may imagine, I think a lot of us Bitcoiners are in a position of feeling a certain degree of vindication and degree of like, you know, well, I told you so, like you should have just not done that thing. But uh, no one likes seeing Bitcoin prices at 15, 16, 17K for extended periods. We don't like seeing our friends and colleagues, despite how wrong they may or have been. No one likes seeing people's wealth destroyed. No one likes seeing people gamed and taken advantage of. Um, it, and, it, and, it, and it does erode trust. Um, I think an experience I have a lot, I'm sure maybe you feel this too around the holidays and stuff. You're going back to your family or your friends, your hometown or whatever. And people have no ability to distinguish Bitcoin from this bag of tricks that's been going on with SBF and hey man are you guys doing that SBF thing is that affecting you and, and part of me wants to shout like no no in, in absolutely no way is that affecting me like I'm so distant from that I'm in a completely different industry I feel sometimes from that but of course from their perspective it's the same thing right so it's a it's a huge black mark I think um, at the same time like and this is the vin this is the vindication part like uh, there are definitely folks that I've spoken with and, and encouraged to avoid these kinds of things that now feel like I saved them a lot of pain and stress. Uh, Unchained has had one of its best months ever in terms of, uh, you know, onboarding and uh, activation of new clients. I think there's a lot of folks for whom um, the freezing of deposits and sort of the runs on some of these third party custodians really highlighted uh, like having meaning to do that collaborative custody thing. I just haven't done that. Uh, maybe this is a good signal that I need to do it. So it's it's been really good for us in that way. But then again, conversely, the price is this down. That really impacts our business. Uh, metrics are down as a result in, in a lot of, in a lot of other areas of our business. Uh, people are, are are scared. There there no, there's not as much top of funnel coming in. I think for all players in the space. Right. So it's it is a crazy mixed time period. It's it's uh, like like almost every quarter. It's crazy for its own reasons, um, I suppose. But um, I don't know. I, I feel very optimistic in terms of other downturns that have happened, like March 2020, you know, beginning of COVID, you know, pandemic stuff. It's like it, there were a lot more abject or even before that, when my company was a lot smaller, when things were a lot more uncertain, there were so many more downturns where I felt like I had less control. I felt like we had accomplished less as both an industry as well as you know my own business unchained. Um, I actually feel that both Bitcoin unchained uh, we're, we're all in a position of strength right now. I think a lot of Bitcoin companies are in a position of strength. And if we can continue to survive, if we can you know continue to innovate in our business models and you know, win and make make happy clients, uh, you know, and I think we can make really big businesses. So I'm feeling very optimistic um, about both Bitcoin as well as the, the companies um, who are helping bring Bitcoin to more and more people. Yeah. Uh, I'm also curious your thoughts around leverage in the space, right? Obviously connected to mm -hmm. what went on with FTX and a lot of the, whether they were badly run businesses, whether they were Ponzi's or frauds or just, fra you know, fractional reserve, right? Have people learned the lesson or is it just like, are we just going to see the cycle play out over and over and over? I don't know. Um, it feels like there's a few big bads, right? Uh, and, and, in crypto or in our world like one of them is the is the getting hacked right the other is the you know the ico speculative mania for like shit coinery that that's not going to amount to much that's that's another way to lose your money um it feels like this third one is wanton um bad risk management across whole you know linked players in the marketplace and and consumers and retail investors and and even whales sometimes not being isolated from that right so there, there's some there's some big bads and, and i feel to your point None of these are new things to crypto necessarily. You know, one of the things I really loved about uh, being on Bitcoin Twitter is you you have so many different kinds of experience. Uh, I, I've loved some of the threads from Arbdout on 
you know, railroad manias of the yeah. 1800s and, or sorry, 1800s and so on. And it's just like, you know, humans are really kind of the same animal in, in a lot of ways. And uh, we behave the same uh, when predictably similar stimuli are, are, are put to us. So I kind of feel like that, that argues for, no, we won't learn our lesson that every new cohort that comes in is going to, is going to, I'm here for, I'm here to fix Bitcoin. Um, I'll, l- let me start my own thing. Let me repeat some of these mistakes around not holding keys. Um, not being transparent about risk um, and so on. But with that said, uh, it, again, it, it does feel like the stuff moves in cohorts and there, there's a cohort that like for whom these events were the reason they became real Bitcoiners, so to speak, right? Like this is what minted a new class of Bitcoiners. I'm certainly not the first to say that. Yeah, no, and I think that's absolutely right. I think this is uh, the common experience for the, those of us who've been around for a while. We see people who come in they're a little bit newer maybe they haven't spent the time to actually Mm -hmm. do some learning about what bitcoin is like not everybody has to be a developer but you should try to increase your technical understanding of what's going on and learn the practical steps of that right whether that's setting up multi-sig whether that's learning how to run your bitcoin node whether that's you know learning how to do privacy stuff like there's all kinds of things that you can learn um and do uh, in in these downtimes, e- evaluating financial services providers with a little bit more skepticism and diligence. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, so I think you know, going through uh, a bear cycle, there are, I guess, there are challenges around that too, right? Everybody's trying to, you know, cut their burn rate and make sure that that we can all survive, right, through the bear cycle. Assuming you know, it's, assuming we're still in a cyclical sort of environment, and eventually the cycle will turn. But it's about trying to survive, then, isn't it? Yeah, um, and it, surviving, but also I think not not becoming afraid in a certain way. I think is important too. That like I think there there tends to be um, at least I notice this. I'm I'm pretty passive on on Bitcoin Twitter and a lot of discussions and stuff, but I do tend to see that um, there's a um, a need for scapegoating sometimes um, in times like this, like when shit is fucking going wrong. It's like, well, who's whose fault is it this time? Who who screwed this up for us? Um, and it's, of course, easy to point at FTX and, and their bad behavior. And I actually do believe there's some credence to notions of like rounded tops last year and, and so on due to various, you know, inter, internal trading things that are very complicated and, 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 uh, and strange. So I, I do believe there, there are some effects like that um, and, and things that we can blame if we want to blame something. Um, I've noticed another curious trend, though, which maybe we can highlight and talk about it for a second, which is like I, I've noticed a trend of like, blaming the concept of credit itself as, as somehow like, you know, that, like, like that, that is the root of the problem. Like Bitcoiners shouldn't be interested in credit or that credit is an evil thing. Credit is fiat. Borrowing is fiat. Lending is fiat. Um, we have a very tribal culture sometimes, especially in Bitcoin and Twitter. Um, and that, but this to me is a very curious reaction um, because it, it strikes me as similar to the sort of person who, 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 you know, lumps SBF and FTX and altcoins alongside Bitcoin and, and, you know, more secure um, and more principled projects, right? It's like, it's just, you're so far away from it that you're not distinguishing a new, uh, good and bad usage, right? There's no nuance in that, in that statement. So I sometimes think that like, there's a lot of ways that you can blow people up with credit in, in Bitcoin and, and credit can be a very dangerous tool, but it can be a very powerful and important tool. Um, I know that Unchained, you know, we've saved a lot of Bitcoin because we've helped people not have to sell their Bitcoin when they didn't want to. Uh, I will. I have seen people get liquidated, though, on our platform as well because they took on too much risk. Um, I tend to be in of the mind where it's like you, you, you want to give them the tool and you want to encourage them to use it safely. But sometimes people are going to make bad decisions um, and it's going to it's going to maybe reform their behavior. Sometimes they're going to make those bad decisions. They're going to look for someone to blame. Um, I, I'll. I have found like the more time I've spent at Unchained and thinking about and ideating around credit products, I actually think credit is a really powerful construct, like just for the growth of Bitcoin. Like there's a lot of reasons why credit is a is a vehicle that brings Bitcoin closer to dollars, that makes Bitcoin more useful. Um, and this is credit can work in both directions. Um, I feel like part of our challenge when we think about financial services in Bitcoin is like we want to provide them in a way that is like in the spirit of Bitcoin. And we want to... Um, you know, expose risk and parcel out risk in a way that's transparent and controllable and meterable by the consumers of those financial services. Uh, the reaction that like all financial services are bullshit, just hodl and don't do anything else. And the world will, you know, 
change for the better just through that action alone, I think is a little naive. And it, it lacks some of the nuance of like trying to understand why some approaches to financial services can be successful in a Bitcoin based world and, and others I think should be, you know, left by the wayside and, and thought of as, as, uh, as, you know, diseases of the old financial world, right? Like notions of, of wanton rehypothecation without any kind of accountability or transparency, I think is something you sort of had to allow, like, or rather the only protection you had being reputational and diligence based, like, well, so-and-so said it was safe, therefore it's probably safe, or their brand is so great, therefore it's probably safe. I think we can, we, we should dispense as an industry with those kinds of approaches. We should move to a more, you know, transparent and um, accountable model where people can, can don't, don't have to make that choice, at least. Yeah. So I, 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 I like to be a little bit more um, courageous and, and not get afraid and, and suddenly turn away from these challenging areas. I want to like, dig in like this is the time when innovation is almost most called for. Yeah. And I've commented on my views on credit. Also, I did an article for Bitcoin magazine talking about why it's not that all credit. It's not that we're against all credit. I think it's mm-hmm. the right way to think of it is commodity credit as opposed to circulation credit. Right. And that's like a kind of like a full reserve version of credit versus a fractional reserve version of credit. And Caitlin Long has been very vocal about this and and others in the space also. Um, and I think what might be interesting, especially from your perspective and your viewpoint, working at Unchained and being a founder of Unchained, I'm curious if you could spell out maybe in your view, obviously not doxing individual customers or whatever, but if you could spell out what were the scenarios where people were able to successfully do it and why, what made it successful for them, their loan, as opposed to customers who maybe it didn't work out for them because maybe they got liquidated or maybe they were a little too risky or not conservative enough. I think it boils down to that, boils down to risk management and your ability to swallow large price changes in, in Bitcoin's motion. There, I think there's a sense in which Bitcoin's volatility can always outpace um, uh, your collateral if you're not careful. Um, so I, uh, it's... It, it tends to be a little bit of a red flag, I think, for our loan operations team in general, but someone borrowing with all of their Bitcoin, using using all of their Bitcoin as collateral. This is not a good idea. Like, w- even if you think we are at the bottom, we can always go lower. Do you have the dollars to back up the change in price? If, if you don't, you probably don't want to borrow against all your Bitcoin. You want to have some dry powder. I mean, Unchained allows you to pull Bitcoin out of collateral for loans um, as prices increase. Um, so you can always get it back. Um, it's just a matter of if you don't have any dry reserve left, like, okay, now you're having to sell Bitcoin, um, which of course Unchained can do. And sometimes that is the right decision and that's perfectly fine. But if you're forced into that solution, you may not feel very good about borrowing or using leverage in the first place. And, and maybe that's the right solution. Maybe you're not a person that can can do that effectively. Um, but for a lot of people, you know, I think we have a great relationship, for example, with miners. A lot of our clients are miners and, you know, they're dealing with the com- combined volatility of Bitcoin's price, but also hash rate and difficulty volatility. And that's a very hard problem to solve. A lot of miners, I think, understand that if they're able to hold their coins like through these like really bad periods, that they get into like an amazing green territory, you know, in a year or two, right? And that selling those coins right now is one of the worst things that they could do for the long-term health of their of their business. And so giving them a tool to manage that is really important. Um, credit is really powerful. Uh, so it's just, you got, you got to do it safely. Um, and you got to do it in a way that, um, gives as much control to the borrowers as possible. Yeah. So I guess the way I'm, I'm seeing it is you should be only borrowing against a small portion or a, a smaller portion of your stack. You should ideally have income that you're able to be paying that loan down with, you, you know, you should be quite conservative in how you do these aspects of it. And, you know, by the time you've, crunched out the numbers or looked at this it may be that maybe you can't borrow as much as you thought you were going to be able to borrow or maybe you just shouldn't be borrowing because it's not the right decision but you know everyone everybody has to make that decision for themselves whether you are an Mm -hmm. individual whether you are a business etc um but i I think it's just taking that right approach in terms of being fundamentally conservative and Mm -hmm. i'm sure you know there are cases where you know people can do this and people can um have saved themselves in terms of tax obligations or saved themselves in terms of not having to sell at a very inopportune time um, from a tax perspective or just from a cycle perspective. Yeah. And and time preference is a big part of it too. You know, I think um, the longer you intend to hold that loan for, uh, you know, I think our, I think we'll offer term loans uh, of multiple years at this point. Um, Though I think the most common period for Unchained at least is about a year. 
but we often do renewals. That's one of the most common ways that uh, a loan ends its life. It just renews into a new loan for us. But if you can hold that credit for a number of years, it puts you in a much more advantageous position in regards to Bitcoin's price appreciation is so tremendous over like the three to five to, you know, six, 10 year time frame that um, it, it's a much more reliable bet that your collateral may be worth a lot more over that time frame than, than necessarily at this point next year, right? Where there's still a huge amount of volatility present. Um, and so I think there are certain like sweet spots for borrowing where it's like, you know, you're going to collateralize 10 to 20 percent of your Bitcoin holdings to make a long term investment in dollars like you don't need the cash back. The investment itself is going to pay out over some long period of term. You'll hold the credit for some long period. Like this can be a very um, effective tool uh, because time frames are, are matched here. Um, I think if you're borrowing because of some short term thing and you're hoping to, you know, at, at this point, there's so many variables that are coming into play in order for your plan to succeed, uh, you know, better to not try that um yeah i think uh, yeah. yeah and i think that's that's a good point as well because without you know attacking individuals in the space or whatever but i think what happened maybe with this cycle we could say and look of course this could be 2020 hindsight but monday morning quarterbacking but i think what happens in some cases is if people are buying too much bitcoin in that sense of not being able to sustainably hold it for a long period of time mm-hmm. not being able to hold it through a bear cycle right like in some cases you know, I think maybe people will take it too far in thinking, oh, I don't want my stack, my stack to go down at all. And therefore, I'm going to borrow against it and just try to never, never, it, it's, a, it's sort of like, you have to be conservative enough to mm-hmm. understand when you can make that work for the long term and when you can't, right? And if you, for example, yeah. if you are not working anymore, you don't have any more income, then you need to be extremely conservative about how much you borrow. Um, as opposed to somebody who is still working and has income to sort of manage things, pay things off and Mm-hmm. kind of keep, keep I mean, the thing ultimately running. this is a this is a financial planning conversation um and i think some people are good at financial planning for themselves and some people are just not and i, I think one of the things that that is an area of a growth for unchained that i think we're excited about is perhaps starting to make a foray into that financial planning space because something that we've learned <clears throat> is that it's just <clears throat> it is very hard to make decisions when you have a you know when you're a bitcoiner and you have uh let's let's admit them strange views to the uh, from the perspective of, of a lot of the traditional financial planning community um, but nonetheless you ultimately need to practice some of the wisdom that that community dispenses like so you can't uh, you, you can if you like be like the the i'm on zero like zero fiat like i live my life you know only in bitcoin and sats and um, i have some friends and employees at unchained that live this way and to me it's crazy like uh, i you know I'm, I'm older i have a mortgage like i have my expenses are in dollars i need to balance dollars and bitcoin and i need to do so in a dynamic way over the coming decades of my life as my obligations change right as i may hopefully become a father and have to deal with things like inheritance and estate planning and all that this is very complicated and and we live in a very in a country that has a huge apparatus of rules and and systems for this and i don't understand all that and so <clears throat> financial planning <clears throat> is a there is a very valuable service it's something that i've actually used for a long time um but only with my dollars i think one of the challenges that i experience personally um and i think a lot of bitcoiners also experience is as you hold bitcoin for longer and longer periods right it grows it becomes a larger portion of your portfolio and if you're not selling it you start to get into these higher and higher ratios of your net worth being in bitcoin and then and then you're now you're a bitcoin right because you're in this, in this position and um, if you have a financial advisor, almost certainly they're not going to be able to work with you and talk to you about Bitcoin. So they're not going to be able to advise you around it. They're not going to be able to have a real financial planning conversation with you about it. Um, and I think what that sometimes leads to is hiding Bitcoin from your financial advisor and just not talking about it, right? Because their advice, if they have any, is going to be, well, I can't talk to you about that and or you should sell it. And so you just don't bring it up. And as a result, you're now not getting financial planning advice that you might otherwise have benefited from, and you're kind of doing it all on your own, which again, for some people is fine. But I think for other people, they, they need that helping hand. They need that advisor um, representing their interests and, and helping them balance Bitcoin and you know fiat holdings over the long term. So I think that's an area Unchain wants to start playing in and understanding a bit more over the coming years is we have a lot of expertise on the team around that area um, over the m- number of years running our business and working with clients on the custody and lending and trading and retirement you know, sides of our business. Um, I think we're in a good position to offer some kind of financial planning that's, that's targeted at Bitcoiners, right? Like the theme being, you know, don't hide your Bitcoin from your financial advisor. Talk about it openly. 
And there's the reason most financial advisors can't is because most firms don't have a thesis around this or they're timid around having a thesis around Bitcoin holdings long term. I think Unchained obviously has a very strong thesis around that. And we could help you do the needful, sometimes boring, sometimes repetitive tasks of financial planning, um, sometimes hard decisions around financial planning. Um, but without defaulting to this status of like, you should probably sell your Bitcoin. No, if, if you believe Bitcoin is the future of the global economy, if you believe hyper Bitcoinization is happening in our lifetimes, probably the last thing you want to do as a productive working young person is sell your Bitcoin. But how do you preserve your Bitcoin over the long term? How do you not fall into these leverage traps? How do you effectively use tools like credit? and tax planning and so on to get the most out of your Bitcoin um, over that time frame. Those, those, that's a harder problem. Yeah. And I think it's also fair to point out that Bitcoin is growing and it's taken, you know, now, what are we now? 14 years, you know, coming up to Bitcoin. Um, and a lot of people, especially people who've been longer time hodlers, like even for me, like when I started, I was a single guy, no, no, you know, no, you know, nothing. Like now, I'm, I'm married. I've got a kid on the way soon. Like it, you, the, where you are, well, thank you. Yeah, uh, it's we have to change certain aspects of how we manage our money, how we manage our Bitcoin when our life situation changes. Um, yeah, and of course, in Bitcoin, many of us are, you know, there's like it's 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 encouraged, right? This whole idea of low time preference, and you should mm -hmm. where you're uh, yeah, the um. I know people debate this question of the Bitcoin fundamentalists, but the Bitcoin fundamentalists or some of them believe that very much in this idea of having a big family and so on. And, you know, uh, yeah, then that that brings in all of these other aspects to the conversation, right? Inheritance planning. What are you doing about that? Um, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, do you want to just tell us a little bit about what's going on um, there? Because I know Unchained, obviously, you have the uh, inheritance, uh, the, the inheritance planning component has become more prominent recently. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, we just launched, um, I think, the first iteration of an inheritance protocol. Um, and it's uh, it, it's very much in the spirit of this kind of financial planning discussion that we're having, right? It's all about advising our clients to be in a good position um, to to plan out um, what would happen, you know, in, in the event of, 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 uh, of their passing. Um, and I think for us, this is a journey. Like this is not a the final product that we would hope to have in this category. I think there are some very sexy things that I think all Bitcoiners can immediately leap to around, you know, time locks and more complex structures and processes. I, I want to get there too, but we'll get there in time. I think that requires, you know, collaboration with everything away from hardware wallet vendors to, to multi-sig wallet software and stuff. But, but it's, it's a place the industry will land at. Um, here we're just starting that journey and just starting to talk about the planning around it. Um, I actually think this is very much a part of that prior discussion around financial planning, um, inheritance, and I think security, right, is actually a major component of what an, an investment advisor or a financial planner um, should do for a client, I think, in a hyper-Bitcoinizing world, right? Like a big role that financial planners and investment advisors have in the traditional world is, is investment management, right, is taking the dollars and growing them over time. That's, that's part of the function that they provide. It's less necessary in a Bitcoin world, right? So does that mean that the, the concepts of financial planning and investment management are useless? Well, no, it just means they sort of have to shift, right? <clears throat> to focus on the other areas where you're gonna now need more advice. And, and especially because of my experience at Unchained, I, I really do believe that um, security and planning your key management strategy and thinking about how inheritance works, not just at a legal, you know, and estate and taxing level, but also at the sort of mechanical cryptographic level of how do keys transfer? Where are keys gonna live? How are you gonna set that up? How are you gonna communicate that to um, the beneficiaries of your estate? Like is, uh, people are gonna be bereaved and freaking out, you just died. Like, are they gonna be able to successfully onboard a wallet and get through a process? Especially if there's a kind of time block involved, right? Imagine that scenario. Um, so I think your financial advisor really starts to play a very stronger role in these aspects of of your financial life in a way that they don't really have to today, right? Right, Because today everything is handled by the legal system. This person died, there's a death certificate, we take it to the bank, like we trigger processes. There aren't keys. And so keys as powerful as they are, as we both know for um, maintaining control um, over one's finances, for representing one's interests. And, and I think they're, they're sort of the, the reason Bitcoin even exists is to so that we can have keys to Bitcoin. Um, it just complicates the hell out of these kinds of inheritance conversations. And so, you know, I think your financial advisor is a person that can really help give you confidence that you not only are they 
growing the fiat side of your portfolio and helping you be in the most tax advantaged position, but they're actually helping you preserve your Bitcoin long term. And then, you know, should you pass, they're helping to make sure it, it goes on to your to your next of, of kin, as, as you specified. I think this is a very cool evolution for that industry. Um, and it's a set of skills that they're going to have to learn, which I actually think would be really exciting for a lot of the advisors that at least I speak with. Yeah, for sure. Um, and so can you give us some ideas around what what is a prudent approach there? Like what kinds of things should we be doing? Is it is it an aspect where you have a key that on your death passes to an executor or what, what's the approach? I think it depends on um, so much on, on who you are and what your situation is. I think that's a one of the generic statements about estate planning, right, is that there are some things that probably everyone should be doing. Um, and then there's a lot of very specific things that depend on you and your family situation, um, whether you have like uh, other sort of legal entities or other trusts or other things going on. Like, um, I'm not trying to avoid the question. I feel like there are some generic, you know, things like uh, you should make sure that uh, you know, keys don't need to be transferred necessarily in the ideal scenario. They can be either, um, uh, they can be instantiated, let's say, from backups or whatever. You, know, you don't want to have to transfer hot keys with like pins or other kinds of structures. And that gets very complicated. Um, thinking about the legal ownership of those keys and who who executes that process. Um, there, there are legal wrinkles here that I don't really understand, frankly, around the concepts of like probate being public versus not and having estate planning, sort of being able to short circuit the probate process and giving you greater degrees of privacy as your property transfers to your heirs. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of complexity in doing that correctly um, that I think the, the key management mirrors some of that as well. And there's, I think, a, a smart synthesis of bringing that all together and making sure it just gets handled in a smooth way. Um, I don't think we're there yet at Unchained, where again, this is a first iteration of, of this product for us. I think we're going to learn a lot from folks who are buying into this and helping us um, gather requirements for a more sophisticated version here. Um, ultimately, I, I've made this point before, and I think I've made this point on your show, Stefan, I think where, where we coined together the concept of collaborative custody, I think in a, in a fine extemporaneous exchange several years ago, it was a great moment for me personally, I felt. But um, you know, I, I think um, our, our, our clients are gonna help us discover like the right um, shape for a more complex, perhaps on chain, um, perhaps multiple keys, like, like, uh, you know, more complex product because that's the heart of collaborative custody, right? Multi-sig is, is the generic built-in thing to Bitcoin. Collaborative custody is all the permissions management, the identity verification, the notifications, the glue to get, gluing people together on the same platform. That's so just a lot of human complexity in that. And that's where Unchained shines, right? So that's what, where we want to step in and, and hopefully serve as advisors to folks, um, service the platform where they're engaging a lot of their Bitcoin based finances. Um, and where they're ultimately they're a big part of their inheritance program will ultimately execute. Yeah, and and it's such a complicated beast because there's the legal aspect of it, there's the financial planning and just what's prudent aspect of it, and there's even a technological comp- component as well. Mm-hmm. Obviously, multi signature, but also even things in Bitcoin like Miniscript. Right? Does Miniscript or does like some kind of Taproot multi sig form a a future part of this? Right? That maybe you have I, like I would advanced... love to see that. You know, some kind of advanced that. wallet spending conditions mm-hmm. where maybe in the standard mm-hmm. case it's two or three, but, you know, there's some extra pathway that is, you know, in the case of death, here's I, now I somebody mean, literally else. Literally a, a dead man switch, right? And I kind of view it as like, you know, you can imagine a, a, a model where you're engaging in a yearly reset the switch, sort of a cop way to put it, but you're resetting that switch yearly um, so that the contract, smart contract, you know, it's, a, it's just a Bitcoin script. Thing, but it's a smart enough contract, right? You're just resetting that time lock in some way, or you're moving it to a new, you're moving your inheritance, you know, portfolio to a new time lock address for next year. Um, who is helping you with that yearly, very important transaction, right? It's probably, it's your financial planner. It's your yeah. advisor, right? They're, they're the person that's making sure that you get that done in a way that my advisor is the person that makes sure I do my, you know, yearly contributions or whatever that I have to do. Um, those kinds of, that kind of life cycle and annual management work, I think very neatly fits into the advisory role. Yeah. And so maybe like an example in that case where it's you now, this kind of thing is early yet. And I I believe Mm -hmm. some of the IGB guys had this My Citadel wallet. You might have seen that. And it it had a similar idea where you could do a kind of, you know, it's it it could be a, a, a given 
level of quorum for multi-sig. Okay, let's say it's two of three. Mm -hmm. But then after a few years, it degrades down into a one of mm -hmm. three multi-sig or something like this. Mm -hmm. So and and so I guess the idea is you could which, be continually which could refreshing. Be, you know, yeah. totally separate keys, right? So the idea is it it's in your live portfolio, and after some time life, if you don't reset it or change it, it's going to revert to a totally different multi-sig quorum, which is now your inheritors or your estate planners or your or your lawyers so they can now dispense with it and get it to the places where it needs to go um, i do think stuff like that is awesome um but at the same time that's uh, a future thing yeah. yeah very dangerous if it's not done correctly oh yeah 100 percent. and so i think uh <clears throat> that's one aspect where it may be only for the uh brave hearted people at the start and then over time you know after the pioneers have kind of Mm -hmm. tested out the system and proven out the kinks and ironed out the kinks then okay now it's kind of more ready for the prime time um system and i think maybe it's a similar thing even with um taproot multisig and music right like I, you know there was a lot of excitement about this maybe a year or so ago when obviously taproot was coming into bitcoin and there was discussion about oh would it make sense for us to do music too or things like this but then i think what happened is people discovered uh, or maybe not everybody understood is that there were multiple rounds of interactivity required in, in a music to context. And therefore it just made sense for us to just keep doing like the multi-sig we have today, as opposed to the music to stuff, which maybe will be applicable someday, but maybe is not the right choice just yet and not put into practice yet. Yeah, no, I, I don't know enough about tap to sit here criticizing it, but I will say that the, that, that change in interactivity um, and the increase in the number of rounds of communication required would, you know, for example, fundamentally change the way that Unchained's product is structured right now. That right now there's a very clean linear flow of, you know, transactions are created by those who are authorized to do so, signatures are accumulated, the transaction is made ready to broadcast, and, and out it goes. Um, that second round of, you know, renegotiation at the end when you're doing the more complex music, you know, whatever, whatever details that looks like, and it just changes the flow. Uh, could we build that? Yeah, of course we could build that. You know, where, but it, but it, it 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 is it's a much bigger lift now, right? Because it changes yeah. the mechanics, the way our application works. I also think that, especially at Unchain, where collaborative custody is is the the practice, we're super reliant on on the, on the ecosystem. Like, um, it, it's a discussion. I, I've actually enjoyed having this discussion with you know our our, our partners and investors at Nidig. Who have a very different custodial model, um, but they're also very good technologists and they're very excited about things like Taproot and actually, in, in some ways, able to make pat progress faster than we are because they can just decide to do it and they can start to convert parts of their system over to using more sophisticated, you know, Schnorr signatures or whatever they want. Whereas for us, this is a literally a collaborative process. We can't just decree and decide that we're going to change how everything works for our vaults. We have to get our clients to participate in the motion of Bitcoin, like as we roll that out over some time period. Um, and that of course re then requires all the hardware vendors, the treasures, ledgers, cold cards, and so on of the world um, to work in the exact same way that we do to support all uh, the same things from these new protocols that we need and also overlap with each other because we don't want to create scenarios where you can only do this thing if you have a cold card and if you want to switch to a treasurer, then somehow your vault product or your loan is in, tr is, is in trouble or needs to be reset or there's some complexity. And we, we want we want simplicity here right, that we're trying to drive towards. So we want yeah. shared behavior. So now we are now we need an ecosystem of hardware wallet providers to all get on the same page about anything at all is very difficult, um, as, as I think a lot of us who, who've been around in this industry for a while know. Um, they're, they're competitors. Um, there, there's a certain drive towards standards adoptions, but even things like PSPT, which are becoming like pretty common standards, are, are not adopted uniformly across all the hardware wallet providers yet. Um, standards yeah. is, a, is a fast moving target in our space. Yeah, yeah. And I think you make a great point, right? Because I think we have to, there is a balance of what can people practically do as opposed to what is the latest and greatest technology because as an example with music two and and the three rounds of interactivity required well that's going to be a very that's going to be a big lift as you said um and what kind of quick wins or easy gains or low-hanging fruit are there that we can just like, for example there are probably so many people who are just using single signature wallets right now and just getting them into a multi-signature context even if it's a mm -hmm. two or three vault with unchained mm -hmm. or someone that it's a huge lift like as yep. in um for some people and but it would also be a massive improvement in their security 
So, Mm -hmm. you know, and we see some people debating in the community about this also, because I see this and I'm curious to get your thoughts as well, because some people in the community are, you know, and of course, everyone has their different view, but some people in the community are commenting and saying, no, look, I I think single signature and just having a passphrase is more practical for people. Stop pushing this idea of multi-sig to people, uh, you know, that uh, it's too complex for people, right? That's kind Mm -hmm. of what we're we're hearing from people, uh, from some people. To be to be clear, um, but on the other hand, there are these big benefits to having multi-signature. Um, so I'm curious how you um, how you see that. I, I'm I'm such a, a broken record here. Like, of course, it depends on the way that you model threat and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, <clears throat> I think different camps are actually supporting the same argument for different reasons. Sometimes they may not even realize it. Um, not necessarily in the in the hardcore Bitcoin community, but there's definitely a single sig camp that um, want single SIG because single SIG is how you generalize to other cryptocurrencies. You don't get to use multi-SIG in Ethereum the same way or in whatever the fuck other coins are out there these days. Yeah. Uh, but there, but a lot of the coins use, you know, BIP32 type HD wallet, you know, architectures. A lot of them use similar and compatible public key cryptography for holding and signing transactions. And so if you stick with single SIG, right, and then I, I, you stick with a single private key, then you can, you can, engage with all that stuff too. So that's compelling for, for those who care about that. And that's why it's a disincentive to embrace multi-sig. Um, I think the complexity argument though is a real one too. Um, and I empathize with the idea that look, at the end of the day, a physical thing is really, is, is quite easy to protect, especially one that you can copy, right? So single sig doesn't mean necessarily there's one point of failure, right? Like you can copy your seed phrase and you can sort it in multiple locations. That creates risk of a different kind if someone discovers it now it's, there's more places for it to be discovered or, or whatever um but uh, at least you won't lose it as easily um, and for most people they're not the the chief threat is not being infiltrated by some attacker in the physical world to get at their threats it's that they're going to lose the words or that their house is going to burn down or some other tragedy that's unrelated is going to prevent them from getting to their bitcoin um, in some way um, or they're, or honestly, with passphrase, they're just going to forget the passphrase for God's sake. Like it's just, it's just, it's a hundred percent what will happen. Or they're going to write it on a, on a, on a post-it and keep it somewhere. And I just think about, you know, my dad and 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 uh, some of the folks in my family I know and their password management. Um, anyway, um, but I, I don't want to deride the practice. Like it obviously can be done very safely. Um, I think a lot of people also who criticize multi-sig as too complex are perhaps conceiving of multi-sig and the kind of it's naked bare do it on your own um sort of implementation which i agree is, is more complex i think part of the reason unchained exists as a collaborative custody option is because there is this intermediate world where you can get a lot of the benefits of multi-sig but with a professional key holder to be in your quorums to bail you out if you lose keys and with a ui and a ux it's well designed and easy to use on the web with support folks you can call get get walk through things like this is this really lowers the barrier to entry. And I know this because we are onboarding um, not people who aren't technologists, older people, um, medical professionals. I say that because my dad is a physician. I know how non-technical physicians can be, right? Like they're holding keys and um, and they're doing it and 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 they're, they're capable of doing it. And we're walking them through it and we're, and we're making this achievable. So I think uh, I'd encourage those who who don't distinguish between multi-sig and collaborative custody to sort of realize that there is a pretty meaningful difference between those two ways of doing multi-sig, quote unquote. Um, and then I think finally, um, in kind of a, a, a fun way, uh, part of the the, uh, the complexity of, of multi-sig boils down to just having to do one thing more than once, right? Like if once you can protect a single key, in, in theory, you can do the same thing more than once, but it's just more complicated, right? So why do you have to do that? Like just the single key is good enough. You can combine these ideas, right? You can have multi-sig in which you just have a single key. So the work on you is pretty similar that you just have to protect that one key. We're not increasing that part of the cost or mental burden, You're still just protecting that one key, but you can choose to be in a quorum in which that's just one out of some number of keys, right? So that can be at Unchained. Right now we offer a multi-institution um, product on our vaulting site. It's less utilized, but uh, it is something that we have some clients doing. And so that looks like you have one key um, Unchained has a second and there's a third party with a third. This is a good construct for a lot of businesses maybe who, who don't actually want to be sovereign for various reasons over the assets that they protect in their treasuries um, for legal or compliance reasons, let's say. But there are there are other interesting models to this. Um, I brought my dad a few times because this is something I do with my dad um, through the Unchained platform. It's kind of a hidden feature. Um, again, it's not very 
It's not something we're doing very publicly yet, but it is a capability within the platform. Um, internally, we refer to this as, as key agents. I'm, I'm a little bit tail and tails out of school right now, but I feel like this is very relevant for our discussion. So uh, with my dad, we've got it set up. So my dad has one key and I'm his second key and Unchained is the third key. And so my dad now is in a scenario where he's still protecting one key, but now he's in multi-sig, but also he and I together um, have control over the wallet. And if either of us loses a key, well, now Unchained can come and back us up. And I think this is actually a really cool model. Like, number one, I, I, I get to onboard my dad. I'm in my dad's quorums and, you know, like, obviously, I love my dad. I love talking about technology and sharing my business with him and, and sharing about Bitcoin with him. So this is a cool way for us to do stuff together. Um, and then two, my dad is, uh, God bless him, he's not the greatest investor sometimes, you know. Um, he will buy and sell Tesla depending on what article he just read about it, right? So it's like, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, he, he can be very emotional about his investments is what I'm trying to say. And so one of the things that's really nice is, of course, you know, the, the Bitcoin, the way that we've implemented here at Unchained this, this feature, it's his Bitcoin, it's in his vault. I'm a key holder in that vault. I have some some rights to sign, but ultimately it's his coins. If he wanted to create a transaction and spend the coins on his own with Unchained, and, and his own, he could, of course, do that, but he never will. Right. He's my dad and he understands this is a thing we're doing. So it's like in order for him to sell his Bitcoin now, he's going to come talk to me. And I love that about it because it means that I'll get to have that conversation. I'll get to say, oh, well, dad, really, why do you want to do that? Like, what are you worried about? Like, like you know, we'll get to at least have that discussion once before he freaks out and just sells it, you know, to buy Ripple or whatever bad advice he got from somewhere. Right. So um, I'm, I'm making it sound like my dad is, is a fool or has no um, in, investment sense. But but truthfully, like, uh, I don't think my dad would hold Bitcoin if he didn't know me. Right. I, I think Bitcoiners talk a lot. We talk a really big game about don't trust, you know, verify, blah, blah, blah. But if we're honest with ourselves, right, so many of us in the early parts of our journey didn't know how to verify. We didn't know what it meant to verify. We were trusting a friend, a family member, a colleague, someone who got us into Bitcoin, someone who maybe held a key for us in the early stages of our own self-custody journeys. And so I think this idea that like, um, there's like a zero to one instant moment where you go and understand everything about Bitcoin and then you can be a Bitcoiner and do it on your own. That's, that's, that's an idealization. That's not how it is. There's a, there's a curve. There's a gradient from, you know, knowing nothing about it to being a full Bitcoiner. And, and the smaller you can make the steps along that gradient, the more people you can, you can convince to climb that hill, right? It's now just one step at a time. And my dad doesn't need to maybe have both keys on his own right now. Like just protecting that one key is enough for him to experience what it's like to use a hardware wallet and sort of marvel at how, you know, this is actually kind of cool that we're doing this just on our own and it doesn't matter. You know, so he's getting the experiences. He's getting to hold Bitcoin in a very, very safe way. I have some visibility into, into his holdings, you know, which, you know, he, he and I are fine with. We have that relationship um, and he's really safe. Um, and I love this. This is a great way for families and friend groups to protect each other. Um, so this is a feature I think we're also going to be pushing a lot on and unchained over the coming year. Um, we've had a, a lot of work to do in other areas, but we're catching up through that work. And this is something I have talked about in other forums elsewhere, um, but it's something we're going to be pushing on quite a bit more now because I think this is uh, people are ready for it. I, I think I, I've been wanting I've been doing this with my dad sort of on unchained sort of quietly on the side for a number of years. Um, but Unchained, I think, wasn't quite ready to push this more broadly. Uh, we're starting to be we're starting to be there. I think enough of our clients are saying, "Hey, I kind of want to do this thing." Um, and and you know, uh, you know, when I look at some of our client vault names and stuff like this, because you know we have some visibility internally into those things, I often see that they're named in in a collaborative way. Like this is the the X family vault, right? Or 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 Bob and Joe's, you know, like uh, savings vault that we're doing together. Um, and so I think this is a, a like when Bitcoiners are on that journey to building their ability to verify, um, working with other Bitcoiners that they trust and love and, and that they know will take care of them is actually a really powerful way to get them to the end of that journey. They don't have to do it on their own. Yeah. And I think it's a, maybe there's a bit of a parallel with uh, this concept of the Uncle Jim uh, idea, right? In a way, you're, you're sort of being a bit of an Uncle Jim for your dad in that sense that you're helping, you're helping hold one of his keys to sort of help smooth him into this process of being mm -hmm. a self-custody Bitcoiner as opposed to a custodial Bitcoiner. So yeah, and I, I actually think this really connects also back to our inheritance conversation. That like this is not an official part of the inheritance protocol on chain yet. We're sort of again incrementally moving these protocols forward. But um, you know, God forbid my, my father were to pass away, I'm in a great position to be able to actually like step in and work with the assets that he had on the Unchained platform and serve as one of the signers. 
Um, and, 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 and conversely, like, uh, I could, I haven't done this, but I could also have him be a key holder in my quorum if I wanted to, I don't have to do it that way in order to do the first thing, but it's an option for me. Um, so I think these are really powerful structures, not just for onboarding, but long-term for inheritance as well. Yeah. Fascinating. Uh, uh, yeah. It's just like a, it's such a big topic and I think people have been speaking about this for years. And I think one of the first, you know, well-known books was, uh, what's Pamela Morgan's book, mm -hmm. Crypto Asset Inheritance Planning. And I believe, uh, off the top of my head, I think it's a 2015 or 2016 book. Um, but things have advanced a little bit since then. And I, I think there's still not really any one resource or one way to do this thing. And so there's a lot of people all trying to figure out what's the best way to deal with inheritance and Bitcoin. Like it's just a hard thing to deal with um, because if you give somebody the keys, well then can they spend now versus like not, not making it accessible. It, there's like almost this balance of how accessible you, you want the keys to be to mm -hmm. the executor or the person inheriting the coins that uh, it's just a tricky balance to set. So, yeah. Um, I know you also mentioned offline that you, uh, you, you've you been thinking a bit about layers in Bitcoin. Uh, so what were you getting at there? It's just, um, it, it's again, another theme that I've been talking about for years. Um, I feel like I've been trying to get some articles out about it, but I'm so excruciatingly slow at writing that um, I'm having trouble getting them out. So maybe I'll just cheat and we can just talk about some of, of this <laughs> sure. stuff. It's, it's, uh, um, and it's been exciting actually in the last couple of months, it's, it's become, it's come back to the fore for me. Um, uh, due to a variety of, I think, chiefly driven by the Elon Twitter, you know, debacle slash savior, depending on your on your perspective on it, I guess. Um, you know, I, I tend to be very like uh, my favorite meme about it is like, you know, the one when people are drowning in the pool and thinking it's like, you know, Twitter and then Tesla and then like Mars program. And it's like, oh, come on, man. Like, you know, that's that's the that's the thing I'm most excited about of all Elon's projects, of course. But um, uh, to me, to me, it, it's just uh, there. There's this really interesting disconnect I've, I've found in, in some of the discourse that Elon himself puts out about this stuff, which is that like Twitter is a town square, it's a public square, and so it should be, it should have these properties. But then I think, but Twitter is also a company, and companies shouldn't own town squares. That's not, you, know, you don't get the town square effect if the company owns the town square. It's fucking branded, you know, the bricks have the company logo on them. You know, that seems a little weird. Like the town square is built by the townspeople. Um, but the, we don't, we don't have that, um, capability on the internet very well, right? Because building a complex application as good as Twitter is like for all its faults, like it's a great tool for disseminating information and, and ship posting and, and learning about the world. Um, it's pretty complex to build that application. Um, it, just in terms of resources, like cost design, um, and I think we're starting to see with, you know, some of the people who are, you know, fleeing Twitter for whatever reasons, uh, re recently that with the, with the Elon stuff, like what are their options, like, you know, to, to go to, right? There's Mastodon, which is, has its issues. Like recently, the big thing, I don't even know how to pronounce this word, but like no, Nostra, Nostra, yeah, yeah. Nostra, um, I've been reading about that. That's very cool. Uh, you know, Sphinx chat uh, was there for a little while. Uh, I heard a little bit more about it last year, but I know it's, it's, it's in this category. Um, it's clear that Bitcoiners and, uh, you know, a lot of people have been working on this stuff too. I want to, I don't want to present it like Bitcoiners are like the only people to see or care about these issues. Like all, a lot of altcoins care about messaging and communication platforms and social networks in some way. It's, it's an animating impulse across a lot of cryptocurrency. Um, but it's been really cool to see Bitcoiners actually build fucking cool, useful, you know, attempts at solving this problem. Um, and to me, like these are the beginnings of kind of like that layered thesis. Right. That like Bitcoin is like that layer one kind of hardest money. And then layer two is like payments, but also routing. Right. Like the Lightning Network is doing two things at once. It's 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 like the, the thing that's valuable on Lightning Network is not necessarily a Satoshi. It's a Satoshi in the right place in a channel where it can be utilized effectively to route other Satoshis. Right. So there's a there's a spatio uh, there's a spatial element to to the Lightning mm -hmm. Network, which is really important. And so it feels like the Lightning Network is beginning to start to address problems of routing and payments. And we're, immediately we're like, great, let's use it to build stuff, right? So cool. Um, I'm glad that we're showing off and building these apps. I, I'm a little skeptical that any of these apps are like the final version of anything. Like Nostra is a really cool and impressive technical achievement and an interesting experiment. But I don't know if you read about it, that, that there's, like, you know, there's deep concerns with how do you scale a, a system like that? 
Like, where's the data going to come from? Um, those are layers that have to get built. Um, and I think one of the things I keep harping about and thinking about a lot is like, what Satoshi, I think, taught us is that layers are really markets and that we have to build layers of markets that are doing and providing different kinds of services. Um, but how we actually like, but each individual market has to be really, really fucking simple, I think, in order to be able to, to become a distributed version of that market. Like the market that's at the core of Bitcoin at layer one is a market of proof of work in exchange for Bitcoin, right? That's the mining process. That's the market that's constantly running. And there's an interesting time element in there. You know, Geeky's work on Bitcoin's time, I think, is deeply connected to a lot of this. Um, but that's not a complicated market, right? It's not selling a, a good that has like all these things hanging off of it that characterize it. Like proof of works are, proofs of work are fungible, right? Bitcoins are fungible. Like this is a very, like the dynamics of this market might be complicated and volatile over time, but like the core service is, is actually really simple to understand, like when you, when you open it up. Um, and I think similarly in Lightning, like Lightning isn't trying to be like a, 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 an app framework for social networks, right? Maybe you would criticize some Lightning companies as, as overreaching in certain of the things that they're doing. I don't know, like that's more of a, a I think reasonable people could disagree about that. But Lightning isn't trying to solve like, all of computer development like on blockchains or something like that. It's not taking that altcoin big bucket approach. It's trying to say, I want to focus on payments routing. I think that's very powerful. That was a smart boundary that we drew as Bitcoiners to, to craft the project in that way. Um, and I think if I always imagine like if Lightning is more successful and we have these um, robust systems for routing SATs online and routing information accompanying those SATs, like then we will organically start to see new markets develop for the things that we need to build like a real distributed Twitter or public town square kind of thing. But again, those markets will have to be extremely small or ra rather extremely narrow. Um, like I don't, it's not a market for social media, right? It's not even a market for tweets. It's a market for, you know, fetching, like, give me the asset that has this as its hash, right? That's the market. And it doesn't, like your file system doesn't actually know why you want this file or what the file is. It's just trying to serve you files, right? And I feel like the market for data online should just be trying to serve you data that you ask for. It doesn't really know why you want it or even what the data is. Um, I think there's something really smart in the Noster, like if you read about in, on their GitHub page or whatever, they talk about, well, how will this scale when we have huge amounts of data that have to get routed through here? And they make a very good point that ultimately mesh networking can potentially be very efficient if the mesh is smart enough to understand the relationship between data um, that's required by nodes and the locality of those nodes, right? So if we're all at a Bitcoin conference and we're all trying to read the same funny viral tweet about our community, you only got to get it to like one of us and then we can feed it to each other in that local environment, right? We don't have to stream the same tweet from fucking outer space to every person in this 10,000 seat auditorium independently and in parallel, right? But to me, that's a um, that's an optimization problem, which really means that markets have to be brought in order to solve it. So we want, and those markets are gonna be only capable of solving this one problem. They're not gonna simultaneously be able to solve the problem of how do we index your Twitter feed? How do we surface the content from the marketplace that is best for you? That's probably a different kind of market. Right? Like, how do we mechanically search through things that are available? That's probably a different kind of market that is monetizing the notion of search and indices on things that are popular or things that you flag. Um, even concepts of liking and retweeting, um, these are reputational signals, right? These are inputs into feed algorithms to better determine for you what should be surfaced based on peer to peer, um, uh, shall we say, ranking of what's interesting at that moment in real time, right? This is what makes Twitter powerful um, in both a good and bad way, right? In the good way that it makes it awesome, but in the bad way that it makes the, the, the company of Twitter perhaps too powerful, right? So like, I, I think of the, these projects are, 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 are showing us that like there's, there's some beginnings to this like happening, but I worry that like, sometimes people feel like, okay, we're just gonna all switch to Nostra. And it's like, I, I, I don't think so. As much as that would be cool that that happened, like it's, it's not going to scale, right? For the reasons that we haven't built these massively horizontal marketplaces for bandwidth and routing and data and algorithms and, and so on. And of course, I'm talking, I'm talking about the world computer. I sound like an ETH head, right? But none of this is happening in a blockchain. Like these are all localized, perhaps parallel structures. I think that's a point that Nostra really also embraces very well. So they recognize that they can't control, like, there's no blockchain here. There's no notion of like putting out a, a tweet or a statement and having it be forever available at all times 
like always, it, it could disappear from a given relay. And the solution to that is to make sure you get it to other relays, right? It's replication, It's which I think is ultimately, again, a market effect. Uh, relays should be in a market for wanting to host the, the data that they feel users will pay them to serve back to them at some subsequent point. Um, and so the idea of there being any the here as compared to a collection of A's or, or you know, uh, indefinite articles here of, of like, you know, there, there are multiple copies of a conversation across multiple relays. There's not just one fucking Twitter. Um, and I think this, this market splitting phenomenon is, is something that's, that Nostra recognizes is actually a good thing because it means then, because there's no one place to have the conversation, there's no one place to squash the conversation as well. Fascinating. And it, there's a few things that come to mind. So at one point, um, I was thinking about this idea. People talk about even like in Unix philosophy, this idea of do one thing and do it well. Mm -hmm. Right? It's kind of that's kind of related to what you were saying. Um, and Compos composability ultimately, I think, is is the is where that's trying to get at. Right? Like the the reason that that's a mantra in Unix is because if things do one thing well, then we can understand their bounds and we can learn how to compose them together. Right? So similarly, like we can build a complex application like a Twitter out of markets if each of the markets does one thing very well, because then we know how to incentivize each layer of these markets to provide the total service that is Twitter. Um, and it can be modular and composable in that way. In fact, it's it's not really even one Twitter anymore. It's which services you do glue together to, to govern your own personal newsfeed, right? It becomes really what, what it looks like. Yeah, and it's kind of pulling together all parts of aspects of the internet and I, I guess notably RSS, right? Like RSS mm -hmm. is a very similar kind of concept. It's this idea that Dhruv Bansal may have an RSS feed and I might be like, oh, I've got my RSS client and I'm interested in what Dhruv says. Let me subscribe to Dhruv's RSS feed. It's a similar, and mm -hmm. even podcasts, like we're talking about on a podcast right, right now, that's, that's using RSS, right? So it's kind of interesting and, where... And, and then when, yeah. when you follow 100 people, now you have 100 RSS feeds, and then we've outsourced to Twitter the responsibility of curating those feeds back to us. And it feels like that's just another market service. We should just be able to, to, to purchase like feed curation engines that I'll tell you the feeds I like, like here is the way I would like you to process them for me. Here's the kind of stuff I'm interested in. And then they're incentivized to give us exactly what we're looking for, uh, whatever that is. But it's not exactly what someone else is looking for, right? It's not, they're not incentivized to give us the content that someone else wants us to see because advertising isn't a part of this discourse. They're only like being incentivized to give us what we directly pay them for. So it's a little bit more self-directed, hopefully. Yeah. So it's interesting. And uh, there's all these colliding aspects of it. Obviously, we're, we're talking about Bitcoin a lot. Mm -hmm. And arguably, what you know, one of the big enabling pieces behind Bitcoin was BitTorrent, right? This whole idea of distributed hash table, and and we're seeing mm -hmm. this even with um, projects like Keat and uh, Synonym. I think they're doing a similar kind of idea. So it's kind of related, is this, which is this idea that you know you can use other people's upload bandwidth as well, not just have one central mm -hmm. server that everyone has to download from. Each peer can also be uploading things too, and so that's also getting to this idea so then i guess maybe the one other aspect that maybe is not so easy to solve let's say is this matter of is it a is it a public record right so for example australian mm -hmm. parliament has this thing called hansard and it's it's a public available record of what the politicians were saying in the chamber and i'm sure a similar exists in other countries in the u.s and everywhere um but then i no, guess we have that, no idea what we have no idea what our dude said at all it's uh, <laughs> right yeah, but I mean, the point being, there's not, and uh, maybe that's old thinking, right? This idea that there should be one canonical public record to prove. As an example, let's say, you know, let's say I did some dodgy things or whatever, or I tweeted out some whatever, and then later I try to deny that and say, oh, no, I didn't say mm -hmm. that. But if Twitter has like a record of what I tweeted, then you can say, oh, no, Stefan, there's a tweet here on the, the public record. But is that an old idea or, or or maybe it's some kind of cryptography thing where you can say, look, Stefan, I can see you signed this message with your private key. I think it's it, it becomes more of a context based statement, right? Like, again, it, it, it's replacing the definite article of the like record with a set of records and different people and entities care about different kinds of records. Right. So, like, I can easily imagine like a, a, a really well-connected major component of such like online data bandwidth, whatever application market, like so, there's some big fat connected component, which is like what most people use for most stuff and like, you know, most discourse and 
perhaps is endorsed by governments or large entities or corporations as somewhat official. And if you can find it within this marketplace that is, you know, maybe tracked in some ways, I don't know, depends, then, then it's sort of official for their purposes. Um, but there's unofficial markets, right? There's wildlands, there's other places that you can go get data. And so you, you might imagine like, like, and there's good and bad versions of this as well, right? There's the notion of I've said something powerful, but dangerous, and it's been scrubbed from the mainstream, but it's okay, you can go find it in, on the fringe. And now that's powerful because I'm hard to silence. But I think conversely, there's this idea of like, I was exploited and I don't know, fucking naked images of me as a kid are now on the internet and, and this is really upsetting to me and how do i how do i get rid of that well okay maybe there is a chance for some kind of moderation or content control because in like the 90 percent space of like most stuff that people are dealing with like that's controlled by some large players and there's a mutual incentive and there's a set of norms and we would just dip, like we we're willing to forego revenue on those kinds of things we don't care but conversely it means that like probably on the fringes that thing still exists right and so i think it, it, to me, it's always like about the freedom and to, to be able to choose to go into certain marketplaces to go find certain things. Like it's it's not about things being impossible; it's about them being harder or potentially more expensive, right? Because they're either, in this case, um, provocative or dangerous or criminal or or sometimes just unpopular, right? They're esoteric, and so maybe they're not available at the Barnes and Noble. You have to go to the odd corner bookstore in the village to go get that particular thing. But that's not terrible to me. Like, I, I feel like there's this, um, there, there's a lot of ways to, to approach this issue, but like this notion that like that convenience of there just being one place to go to get a thing is like such a dangerous idea in some ways that like we shouldn't have to search through a number of different providers and marketplaces and shops in order to find the thing we want. We just must be able to go to Amazon to find it. We must be able to find the, the, the tweet on the Twitter. We must be able to find the truth on this page. It's a very dangerous impulse, I think, because it leads to centralization, right? It leads to, um, well, then now if it's not there, it basically doesn't fucking exist anymore. And that, that can be very dangerous. Um, right, because it allows the whole black holing or memory holing of various ideas. And maybe those ideas are very important, especially over the last few years, as we've seen people shutting down you know, uh, the anti-lockdown people when I, I believe they were proven to be correct over time. But uh, anyway, I, I want to also get to one other area where... You were mentioning as well about this idea of Bitcoin security and just generalized internet and computer security. And you see that there's an interaction here. You see there's a there's there's some way that they are going to be more related in the future. I mean, I feel like this it connects to a lot of what we were just talking about, like from the perspective of of if more and more of the world's like infrastructure online starts to run through Bitcoin in some way, because it's being directly monetized and paid for and metered in, in some meaningful way, then it just means that so much of what's digital now becomes connected to money in a way that it isn't today. I think that's that's the root of the argument that I'm going to make. Um, I'll try to condense the argument into a few brief minutes here, but um, it kind of looks something like, uh, I'll, I'll take this angle on telling the story, like in my experience at Unchained, I have learned um, in my experience as a Bitcoiner, right? I have personally become more secure like in, the, in a digital context because of Bitcoin. Like I, I started using a password manager years ago because I first bought Bitcoin and sort of was like, well, I'm, a, I'm a security, I should care about security now. And I'm getting to hardware wallets helped me understand a lot more about my security posture. I, I use VPNs now, I'm using more open source password managers, obviously working at Unchained, my security expertise and, and requirements for me has, have really gone through the roof as well. That's been a huge part of it personally. Um, but it's not just people who are running, you know, Bitcoin banks over here that care about security now. It's every Bitcoiner cares about security because Bitcoin forces you to think in those terms. Um, and dentists and, you know, politicians and, and average working people who have Bitcoin, who are on-chain clients, are now using multi-sig, hardcore fucking cryptography. That something that was considered a, a, a defensive weapon or, or a weapon, and I don't want to inflame that whole conversation, but like, you know, something that was once considered very dangerous now in the hands of average people protecting their resources. This is very cool, right? So Bitcoin is like in some sense a killer app for security just on that one basis alone. But I think it gets it gets a lot deeper than that. Um, and and because there's, a, it turns out, I think a very like interesting economic angle to computer security, which is not well appreciated. Um, it manifests in two ways. Like the first is just the idea of like, it's cheaper to get hacked and then pay a fine than it is to build good security. And most of the time it doesn't matter. Like, you know, 
Equifax or Experian got hacked. I can't even remember which one got hacked because we don't care anymore. They paid the fine and we all moved on. They're still in a position of power and influence. So like the truth is that the economics say that good security is not worth paying for. It's cheaper to just have bad security and then pay the cost of fucking up. Like, so that's one of the economic like levers here. Um, that's hard to correct. But that's very social and sort of like um, amortized across everyone's losses and stuff like that. I think there's another angle though that is much more explicit. And that's like, what about people that actually care about security? Like the truth is that they can't achieve computer security either. Like Google can't achieve secure networks. Um, the FBI and NSA can't achieve secure networks. Their own hacking tools have been hacked and released and sold for Bitcoin on public auctions in the last few years. So it's not just that like average people aren't good at computer security. Like the people who are professionally supposed to provide computer security can't really achieve it at scale. Um, and the reason for this is, is you know, it even touches on Ethereum where it's just fucking computers are impossible to predict. Like the Turing halting the halting problem like the fact that the the only certain way to know what code does is to run it um complexity all these ideas conspire to mean that we just don't know what bugs exist in the code that we run we just don't know so it's impossible to make secure software um so now what happens is when a bug is found in some secure piece of software like so you might hope for like okay the bug report gets filed they fix it okay so maybe that happens for a lot of times but what about like when a security researcher finds a really powerful bug in like an Apache web server or like Microsoft Word or Windows itself or some fucking tiny thing inside of Windows that lets you get in and be able to do crazy stuff. What do they do with this knowledge, right? Like they can make no money from it by reporting it and and handling it in the usual ways. Maybe they'll even get ignored and they'll just feel marginalized or they can sell it on a zero day marketplace uh, on the dark web. And they can easily get hundreds to thousands to sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars for depending on the nature of the exploit. Now, this is super interesting because this creates a time period, right, in the life cycle of this exploit where some people know about the exploit, but not everybody knows about it. And this is what makes computer security possible because your system can have a hole in it and you don't know about that hole. Um, Potentially no one knows about that hole, but potentially someone does know about that hole who isn't you. And now your system is insecure and you don't even know that, right? The reason that that hole exists and that economic um, hole exists is because the average security researcher who discovers a flaw in Microsoft Word or Apache or whatever the tool is, can't turn that into money directly. Because what are they going to do? Like they're going to steal your Microsoft Word files, but it's not going to help them. Um, in theory, they could ransomware you, right? And we're starting to see that the rise of Bitcoin, you can see the economic connection, right? That like ransomware is on the rise because Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are on the rise. You couldn't, you know, encryption has been around for long enough where you could have been shredding and encrypting people's files 20 years ago. And you, but what, how would you have benefited? You send me a check to this address. It's like, there's no next step there. Um, so on some level, you can see that cryptocurrency existing allows ransomware to exist, which increases the threat level of, um, of, of, of bad actors, um, the idea that like, if I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of try to turn this around and say like, if it were possible that every security researcher or, you know, hacker or whatever, every time they discovered an exploit, if they could immediately use that exploit to make Bitcoin directly, then they would do that, right? My claim is that the more software that runs Bitcoin, the more opportunities, sorry, the more software that interacts natively with Bitcoin on the internet, the more opportunities there are for a bug, however shallow or whatever, to cause the um, discoverer of that bug to be able to earn Bitcoin. So, for example, if in order like Microsoft Word, how do I get money? Out of it? If, if I can just get Microsoft Word to make you know web requests for me to my server, you're going to pay me in SATs because I'm sending you data. So suddenly, like every hole can become something that I can immediately exploit to get Bitcoin. So this changes the game theory of the marketplace for exploits instead of hoarding an exploit and selling it into this private marketplace, which then is bought and sold by other hackers or oftentimes governments and corporations who are actually just buying zero day exploits about their own software to protect themselves. Instead of having this crazy marketplace, what happens is as soon as an exploit is discovered, it starts being exploited, right? And you get into this position where either your software is secure or it's being actively exploited right now. Um, and I think we've already reached that place with certain things in Bitcoin. So, for example, like the Bitcoin core software, like, like, would you believe there's a bug right now that allows someone to steal your UTXOs in Bitcoin without having your private keys? Like, maybe that bug exists. Maybe it does. I don't know. But what I can fucking say for sure is there's no human being who knows about that bug. Because if they knew about it, they would start to use it, 
right? They would start to exploit the bug because they'd be getting Bitcoin out of it immediately without having to do anything else. So the fact that that isn't happening, that we're not sitting here talking about the giant Bitcoin bug that exists, that's causing people to steal UTXOs, means that there is no such bug that anyone knows about. This is a very powerful statement. I'd love to be able to make that statement about Microsoft Word, Apache, Windows, Unix tools, et cetera. And I feel like the only way we get there is by closing that zero day marketplace to nothing, which means that all software has to run Bitcoin, which means that all software is exploitable directly for Bitcoin, which means that all bugs are either being exploited or they don't exist. I think this is a very powerful new paradigm for how to think about computer security that really hasn't made it out to like the world of computer security researchers or even even Bitcoiners yet. Um, yet we know it, we, we understand it, because I would say we know Bitcoin is probably the most secure piece of software in the world because of its monetary footprint. And what are the next most secure pieces of software? I'm going to guess Bitcoin wallets and things that are already adjacent to Bitcoin because they're how you steal Bitcoin. And so bugs in those things get found very quickly, exploited and then fixed. So my conjecture is basically the more we Bitcoinize the Internet stack, the more we actually achieve potentially real computer security for probably the first time since the internet began. I see. So it, you, we can maybe frame it like a an advancement of things like having bug bounties and darknet markets for zero days, uh, but taken to more of an extreme or taken to a more actualized sense or more uh, popularized in a way. If, like if bug bounties were to get software, popularized. Yeah. I love that actually, that framing. Every piece of software is, once it interacts with Bitcoin, becomes its own bug bounty. Just because if you can exploit the software, now you're getting Bitcoin, so people are going to do it. Yeah. But it could also be scary for some people, right? They could be like, hey, what? You mean like my banking software has all these bugs in it? But I think that's also the reality is that, that there are. That's you true know. today. That's yeah, true exactly. today. <laughs> <laughs> it's, that, uh, it's that people were able to live in ignorance for so long. Mm -hmm. And I think maybe, maybe, maybe Bitcoin is going to change that too. So we'll see. Hey. No, I think that's right. Yeah. All right, well, I think it's a good spot to wrap up here. Um, Drew, where can people find you online and uh, if you have any uh, closing thoughts for people? Well, I tweet at uh, Drew Bansell on Twitter, um, which I guess will still be around for a while. And <laughs> um, I blog sometimes at Unchained. Uh, but uh, I recommend for, for all those that aren't familiar, do come check out Unchained. Uh, blog for a lot more crazy ideas from other folks and, as well as our product, which I think is one of the safest ways to hold Bitcoin for the long term. Fantastic. Thank you, Drew. Thanks, Stefan, for the opportunity.